So I'm joined today by uh, Billy uh, Curry, just chatting t uh, to me about his uh, musical career highlights uh, in Ultravox. And uh, in my interview, we uh, were talking about Vienna. Just moving on to your other hits now, more singles followed in Ultravox. And another standout track of yours is A Voice as well. Is that one of your favourites in your catalogue? Um, not really. It's funny. Uh, it's just... It, it's when well, we all write, and we were we were a democ democratic. We all uh, share, and that classical feel in the in in the chorus was written by Midge and Chris, and I liked it. It was very very good, very up, but it wasn't really the kind of feeling I would have come out present represented as classical. But I did quite like the verse because it was quite free, free and easy, a little bit of our Germanic background, like noi. You know, so I, I I I half like it and half don't. Mm. It's quite good to play live. Uh, so, but uh, it, it it's very funny when other members of or people you're working with take on what you're actually doing and represent it and, and and make a version of it back to you. It's just the fun and games of being in a band. And also a song called "Him" as well. Um, is it from the album um, "Quarter"? Is it? Quartet. Quartet. And it just missed the top 10 spot, but it's, an, it's a bit of an anthem, isn't it? It has been covered by various dance artists. Um, how does it feel when That's you hear, cool. how does it feel when you hear other people cover your material? Uh, well, it is, I like that. It's been used a lot by a lot of dance artists. It got to number, yeah, and boy, we didn't get into the top 10. God, there were some eruptions there. I remember doing Top of the Pops <laughs> and we were, I think we were number 11 then. And of course, we expected it to go straight into the top 10 and it didn't. Oh, God. Um, yeah, you, you are living on the edge um, in, in the early 80s. It could all go wrong any minute. Uh, uh, yeah, it was fun that. I mean, I don't know if you ever remember a band called Tuxedo Moon. They were from. Erica, they had a violinist in it, uh, and I was doing a short tour with him in 1996, playing Renegar, and um, we got into the tour truck, and they'd all ganged up on me and decided to play this trick, and they played this track, this this disco track of him as loud as possible for me to just uh, blow my mind, you know. This bill is in the top 10 in the German charts at the moment. It's your track. Can you even recognize it? I said, I hardly can. That was the beginning of it. And there have been so many that I've had to uh, okay or not. I usually okay them. It seems to lend itself. I, I did write that uh, melody. You know, it's, it's so simple. A lot of my stuff at writing is quite like a nursery rhyme. I, I'm sorry to actually admit that. I just love simplicity. And if you think that, you know, da, 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 it's almost like a, a nursery rhyme, but we've had lots of fun playing it and, uh, and lots of people have had a lot of fun covering it, you know, dance, dance people. And then you were back in, back in the charts um, in 1984 in the top three with Dancing With Tears In My Eyes. Um, would you describe that song as more kind of mid to up tempo ballad in a way? Uh well, it's, a, it's it's slightly ballad in that it's emotional, uh, you know, the way Midge in the verse goes, we drink, da 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 you know, it's quite um, quite emotional. Now, it's quite up, when we play it, it's quite up-tempo, really, uh, in rock. It's kind of a bit of a rock feel to it, mixed with the classical. Um, that was, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm blowing my trumpet all the time, it sounds like I'm but I, I, we were rehearsing for the Lament album, and I was a little bit out of it at first, uh, tracks that were being written, and I was kind of slightly following. And when I was at home once, I had a lovely um, Baby Grand Art Deco piano, Boyd's Baby Art Deco piano, in a white room, and I used to... It's lovely, you know, to have that. And I just came up with this melody, you know, dum 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 and then it was that was the chorus. I came in and played it to the guys, and it was great. It just seemed to happen. It just happened so quickly, and the verse. Mitch came up with the verse, and I remember when we went into the verse, it just sounded really just right, just right, you know. It felt like we'd got a hit the way it just rolled on along by itself 
and it's it's got a it's a classical feel that chorus but the piano's quite down so it doesn't down in the mix so it's not too mm. too classical it's quite a rock track okay i've got a very good memory of we did that at mayfair studios again at um primrose hill where we did the second visage album and uh, i remember walking in and you had to go through you open the door and you went through along this tunnel before you came to where the desk was it's a beautiful studio very uh, impressive john hudson studio and i could hear midge double tracking his vocals and i i thought boy he has really gone for it <laughs> it was a real positive thing like wow he has really, really gone for it, you know. So when you're hearing the dancing, there's a lot of double tracking, you know, so it's been tracked quite a lot. And why not to get an effect? You know, you do what you can, what the studio's got to offer. But I can distinctly remember thinking, boy, this track is, is going somewhere, you know, because, you know, it's all very well me writing stuff, but if the singer you're working with doesn't get inspired, we're going to go nowhere. Mm. So he obviously got inspired. And uh, the music video, when you watch the music video, does it have, um, does it reflect like the modern times about what's happening in the world, you know, like radioactivity and nuclear power? Yeah, it did. It did at the time. Yeah. That was Midge's idea with, with the um, video. He was getting really very well into video at the time. We talked about it first, of course. Yes, it was very much at the time. The East and the West, um, the nuclear power worry that was going on at the time. I mean, we'd written a lot of that into our music in the 70s, and it was still coming through in the 80s because we went, we travelled to Berlin quite a lot. So we saw this at first hand when we went into West Berlin. Because when we went through in the 70s, when we didn't have any success, we were driving across East Germany, so we saw everything, what it was like in the East. But, of course, in the early 80s, when we got success, we were flying across to Berlin, you know. And the Russians made you fly along a tunnel on Pan Am. I think they only allowed Pan Am to do it mm -hmm. then. Don't quote I think, but I think it was just Pan Am. I remember on the American airline, and you had to go, you nearly were sick, this we'd got money that's why we could afford to fly to berlin but you had to fly very low so it was a very very bumpy ride and i remember uh, crossing over the fence to, to land in berlin and you were literally just a few feet above it it's because that's the only way they would allow you to to it was too risky for them to let planes to fly at a proper height it was it was crazy and it summed it up at the time it was a very paranoid time 1984 it really was and uh, I'm on to your track called Lament. Um, I've, I've, I've looked at some of um, the comments on, you know, like um, YouTube and everything, and it's wonderful how it's so well received. Um, and it has helped many people, you know, go through what they're going through in life. And, and yeah. do, you, do you think that song is, um, is underestimated by um, many people? Um, well, it didn't do very well. Um... It was almost like the end of the band, you know. It's a very emotional for for me because I'm, I'm I'm actually in the band, you know. I know what what was going on at the time. There wasn't a very good atmosphere when we released that, and I don't know why we released it in the middle of summer, which is very strange. I think it needed a more atmospheric time, you know, autumnal or middle of winter like Vienna. Mm. Uh, but it's a nice. I mean, I can say that I came up with the music, you know, the 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 chords for the verse. And, and, of course, that melody in the chorus. But Mitch and Chris had a great time playing synthesizer melodies, you know, the subtle, nice, emotional doo-doo, doo-doo, doo you know, doo nice. Uh, it's a PPG, which is a new synthesizer at the time, quite glassy and a bit metallic. They, they came up with, made some very emotional melodies. Yeah, I think it is a very emotional song. When we got back together in 2009, we went over to Italy, and we only did a couple of gigs there, which was silly, really, because we were very popular. And they all joined in singing uh, the, the, the chorus, and it was actually, it really was very touching. <laughs> very beautiful. Wow. And, um, it had and to <laughs> Um, towards the end of the band, um, it kind of um, you went your own way, uh, dissolved. Did you venture into film soundtracks afterwards? Um, not really. Uh, I mean, when I put my when we split up, I was building my own studio from nineteen eighty in nineteen eighty five, and we did another album, Uvox, but we were kind of going splitting up really. 
and I did my solo album there with Steve Howe, Transportation. And I did Stand Up and Walk there, my second solo album. And who was helping me build my studio? But guess who? Some fairly unknown filmmaker, Hans Zimmer. Yeah, it's You've back, to, back to the future, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you might not have heard of him. So I'm joking. <laughs> Hans, sorry, Hans Zimmer. Sorry, I'm being stupid. Yeah, Han, Hans gave me some tips, and well, you know, and he, he taught, gave me some tips about um, the speakers to get, you know. And I took advice because I got some rock speakers in there. So when I was doing my first solo album, I was actually moving more to doing more anthemic, filmic type things, you know, like. My first two two solo albums are quite filmic, so I was reaching in that direction a little bit. Because when you do instrumental albums, it, of course, you're thinking about the film world. But I'm I'm much more I'm quite a selfish person. I just think more about what I want to do. I, it turned out that wasn't really very cut out to do film music, but I did uh, rent a studio in Canalot Production Studios just near Labrook Grove in the. I'm not sure if they're still going. I think they are, where it was a hive of activity of filmmakers and, you know, and video makers and, and film directors. Uh, and it was nice being there. And I did try to get made an attempt to get into the to the film world. And I, I got in as a sidestep through doing some uh, adverts, but it just didn't happen. I think they might have just been a bit wary about getting involved with a, a pop star, you know, an ex-pop star, because they put rest so much responsibility on someone to write music for their films. I, I almost sympathise with them, you know. Why would they take on a, someone who's been used to getting his own way? Because Ultramarks were four people that always got our own way. And we did have a reputation for that, you know. We always told the record company what to do. That's how we worked. That's how we were happy. If they tried telling us what to do, we'd just quit, you know. Yeah, just wrapping so up. I, basically, to answer that, I tried and I failed. <laughs> just for three years. Um, just wrapping up the interview now, we're in uh, 2023 now. Um, do you have any projects happening at the moment or new kind of back catalogues or new releases you'd like to tell us about? Yes, I I'm reissuing all my solo albums, 11 of them, and I'm going backwards. I'm now at um, Keys and the Fiddle, which is like the eighth one going back, uh, which, which came out in 2001. This is through Burning Shed. And I've, I've just been doing that just now. It's Keys in the Fiddle, which is a compilation album of all the tracks that I wrote between 1983 and 1999 that didn't make it out on an, onto an album. I'll be writing a little bit of a thing about it as well, what the tracks, how, how they came about. But there is information on my website, billycurry.com. Uh, so I'm just organising that now with Burning Shed. And they're doing a really good job. And I'm also writing a new album as well, uh, that that's on the boil <laughs> brilliant well thank you very much for joining me today we're about to run out of time but thank you very much for reminiscing about your uh your well your your amazing career in Notch rocks and your solo stuff as well well that they will have it billy curry on the danny cerner radio show thanks for joining me today thank you very much i really enjoyed it thank you, thank you very much